there's a the entire world, everything we do needs to change for us to survive. And this is something that I think is important to sort of put out there first, is that if you're thinking about working in climate, everything can be a climate job. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Whether you're writing the first sentence of a story or solving the climate crisis, you need to think in new ways. On the show, I interview peak performers who are coming up with those creative solutions. Through creativity, action, inspiration, and innovation, they're changing the world. I also bring you ideas and techniques that you can use to unlock your potential to do the same. And now, let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super happy that you've taken the time to listen today, especially because I already adore this week's guest. Let me tell you about Dimitri Gershenson. He's the CEO and co-founder of Enduring Planet. Dimitri started Enduring Planet building on his over 10 years of experience across climate operations and impact investing. And we're going to talk about each one of those things. I'm super excited. Prior to Enduring Planet, Dimitri led M&A and served as COO, Chief Operating Officer, for Rango Wireless, an Enduring Ventures portfolio company. Before that, he built Meta's Energy Access Program, a 15 plus million dollar investing initiative that enabled energy access for over 3 million people and unlocked more than 500 million in additional capital in underserved markets. Yes, catnip to me, absolutely. Outside of Enduring Planet, Dimitri sits on the board of EcoSafe, or EcoSafe. I'm gonna have to ask how to pronounce that because I probably did it wrong. A lower carbon back climate startup enabling clean cooking in emerging markets. Wow, Dimitri, thank you so much for being on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat. I am too. We started chatting before we we pushed the record button and we have some things in common. So I'm very excited about, about getting to chat with you. I do want to start off right away with how did you get here? How did you get from some of the things that you've done, Rango Wireless and things like that, to going, you know what, I am going to work on what I personally consider to be the greatest issue of our times, which is the climate disaster. Talk to me about what got you here. So I, in some ways, I've been working on this problem my entire career. I think the the, the stint at Rango was probably the maybe the only time that I wasn't touching climate change with my day to day in, in my like 13 years of, of work. It, it's funny because I don't think that when I was younger, I really envisioned working on this problem. I mean, one, I didn't really get it, mm-hmm. even though I think a lot of people got it already. When I started school, I, I ended up working on climate in large part because I couldn't figure out what else to work on. I I tried journalism, I tried anthropology. I wanted to be a a forensic anthropologist for a minute. And I discovered that you can't really do that as a job (laughs) because there's only like one of them (laughs) formally employed in the US and and they work for the FBI or something. And the rest of them are all professors and I really didn't want to be a professor of anthropology. And my my brother was an ecologist in undergrad and he's actually also an entrepreneur and also in, in sort of the sustainability space and I, at one point i just needed to pick a major and i was like okay well i guess i'll do what my brother did because he's older and, and wiser and he, maybe he's got something figured out and then i spent a bit of time abroad i was in the peace corps in latin america and i started to understand that there were some really fundamental issues around sort of progress when it comes to sustainability for people. Hmm. Um, You know, how uh, energy systems were being developed in emerging markets, how sustainable agriculture was being employed. Um, There were all of these gaps, right? Places where resources were not being deployed to help sort of equitable distribution of wealth and sustainability in a lot of the world. And so that that took me on this path of, you know, I wanted to work on policy for a little while. And then I, I sort of landed in capital as the lever that I could pull. Um, and that's what brought me to Facebook. 
and and sort of building the energy access program there with some really incredible people. And I think we did pretty good work. A lot of that was was sort of providing catalytic money to folks that were making investments. Um, companies like SunFunder and Lendable, responsibility. And that's what really got me thinking about sort of the different forms of money in climate and why some were moving, some were not, and, and sort of where the opportunities were. And so last year I had this, this incredible chance to build something with the support of the Enduring Ventures team. So we, we uh, Enduring Planet actually came out of a, a venture studio that's run by Enduring Ventures. And um, they enabled us to like really sprint on this idea in a way that I think uh, other circumstances probably would not have. And for us, you know, the whole point behind Enduring Planet is to build a, a platform that offers climate entrepreneurs non-dilutive sort of founder-friendly capital at basically every stage of their journey so that whenever they, they need money to grow, they don't, you know, they don't have to go and raise it from VCs. Uh, they don't have to be venture backable in the first place. Like they can access capital based on, on real traction and performance rather than some like abstract notion of what is, you know, going to be a unicorn. Like you don't have to be Adam Newman to raise money from us. And I think that's really important with climate. Absolutely, especially since it's taking some innovative, really ingenious kind of thinking in order to look at this global issue in a way that could be substantive. So I love, I love pretty much everything that you said. All that I can, all that I can remember, to be honest. Uh, I, I do. I'm, I'm hard pressed because I feel like what you just said about you don't have to be a unicorn already to get funding to work on climate change, I think is so important. I think a lot of people are, uh, they're starting to wake up to the fact that they, that, that something needs to be done first, but that they might even be the ones to do it. So how, I'm going to get to the nuts and bolts. How does someone who goes, you know what, I have this idea. Do they come to you with an idea? Do they come to you with something that's got proof of concept? How does someone come to Enduring Planet and go, hey, I'm this person and I have this idea to work on climate change as, a, as what you call the climate entrepreneur. And so there I am. What, what, would, what would those steps look like for someone who's got this idea, who wants to work on conservation and doesn't really know where to begin? Yeah, so I, I, I think it, it depends. It's good. I'm going to give you first a non-answer and then a very real answer. <laughs> so awesome. um, I, I think there's a million different ways to work on the climate crisis today. And it can range from, you know, being a mechanic who works on electric vehicles to installing solar, to selling heat pumps, to building software that, you know, uh, uses sort of spatial analysis and ML to understand methane leaks to building the next, you know, piece of hardware that enables the grid to sort of adapt to climate risk. Like there, there's, there's a, the entire world, everything we do needs to change for us to survive. For sure. And this is something that I think is important to sort of put out there first is that if you're thinking about working in climate, Everything can be a climate job, literally everything. You, you do bookkeeping, you can do it in climate. You do design, do it in climate. You teach math, you can inject climate into your work. Now, obviously there, there's, there's a level of sort of privilege um, that's required to be able to make those choices. Some people don't have that privilege, some folks like don't have a choice of where they work or how they work. And, and this, this like messaging that I'm putting out is, is, is less for them. I think there are obviously still opportunities for them to engage with this problem, whether it's like political activity, dialogue, uh, you know, whatever. But for folks who have a choice in their work, like there's never been a better time to work on this problem. So I think that's, that's one. Two is, so let's say you are already working on this problem. Um, 
today Enduring Planet offers capital in a couple of different ways. So one is that we provide revenue-based financing to post-revenue climate entrepreneurs who have a, at least, I'd say, a year of compelling traction and growth. And we generally want to see at least 25K in monthly revenue to provide that product to entrepreneurs. Um, so that, that's one instrument. So that's, that's really meant for sort of early revenue businesses, folks with growth, revenue, good gross margins. They're like showing that they have sort of demand in the market and that there's an opportunity to take our capital and invest it into that growth and really go further. And that can be venture back startups. It can be small businesses. It really doesn't matter as long as they meet their credit criteria, those credit criteria on our website, at least a few of the key ones, not the entire, not the entire analysis, but some of the main hurdles are up there. And then the other instrument that we have today is that we can help companies bridge what is often a very painful time between finding out that they receive some state or federal grant funding and actually getting that money. So we, we have an advanced product that we offer to, again, small businesses, startups who are, who have sort of heard or found out that they are the recipient of, you know, money from the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, California Energy Commission, NYSERDA, like you name the agency. If you're getting funds from them to work on a project that's related to climate change and you have to wait six to nine months to sign a contract, get a budget approved, blah, blah, blah. Like we will advance some of that capital for you. And so those are the two products that we have today. And then over time, we will start to add other instruments that enable us to serve more and more of the sort of climate community. We firmly believe that basically throughout the entire journey, there are opportunities for us to provide non-dilutive financing. Now, there it will always be cases where you need to raise equity, okay? Like even in the cases of where we can provide revenue-based financing to a startup, generally it won't fulfill their entire capital needs. And this is where entrepreneurs really need to be thoughtful about what are they raising money for? Hmm. So if you're going to invest the money that you raise in near-term revenue growth, you should probably try to get debt to do that so that you're not giving up a portion of your business for something that generates very near-term value. If you're going to be investing in IP, in you know equipment, in things that are like very long-term value producing, that's where equity becomes more relevant. But even then, there might be cases where you can access debt. So for example, sometimes people will say, well, I need to raise a million bucks so I can buy this machine. I'm going to go raise it from DCs. And it's like, well, but there's also equipment finance out there, in which case you could pay off the machine with the revenue you generate from the machine. And so you should... Think about like, what is the sort of return on that investment for you as a business? And then can you then take in cheaper, less dilutive money as an alternative to equity? Because equity will always be the most expensive, right? For you and for the, for the business. So that maybe that's where I'll stop. But I, I think those are some of the things that we think about when we talk to founders. Um, we, we're very focused on helping entrepreneurs make the right decisions for their business, whether it's our capital or not. Like uh, I would rather a company take somebody else's money if it's better for them. I love that you said that. It sounds, it sounds, uh, I mean, your whole, your whole business is to me very altruistic, which is great, but also caring about the actual person, caring about their specific situation and wanting them to do well. I think it behooves all of us to, to be more that way actually, because we're all, you know, we're all on a rock hurtling through space uh, and nobody gets out of here, uh, at least anytime soon. So uh, the question that I have for you, though, is you're, you're talking a lot about sort of the, the, the fundraising part of this. I'm assuming insufficient funds is a big problem. What are some of the other issues that, that entrepreneurs who want to work in the climate space are facing and what might they do about them? Oh man. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's very early, like in some ways the climate sort of business community has existed for a very long time. Um, you know, there was like the clean tech wave, there was the sort of residential solar wave and the, and, and a lot of the like renewable energy development that has happened in the U S over the last few decades, it's been happening, 
but in many ways, it's still the very early days and it's kind of the wild west. And so a lot of the systems that exist in more mature markets don't exist in climate. Mm. And that means that it's, an, it's, it's often harder to get started, right? But that is changing. And so there's, there's now more government support. There's state and federal support that did not exist before, right? Like the IRA is a great example. There's now 37 billion a year in tax credits available for climate that just didn't exist a year ago, right? And similarly, there are programs often at the state level where entrepreneurs working on this problem within the confines of that state can get quite a lot of help. So California has one of the most impressive programs in that regard, um, but also just New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, Oregon, Washington, there's like a bunch of places where you can get uh, all sorts of benefits for working on this problem. There's now also more enabling um, sort of layers and, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's the wrong word, but like lubricant <laughs> in the ecosystem. And so in making uh, it frictionless, I understand. Yeah, Go for it. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, man, my brain just went to all the wrong places. So like, <laughs> you know, there's players like, um, like, uh, green work, uh, or Teradu or climate base or my climate journey or work on climate that like it are act as this channel for folks to participate climate draft just launched there's like all of this infrastructure that's being built to facilitate this transition to a new climate economy and it's it's early it's i mean it's one of the wildest times to be working in this space i don't think i've ever been as excited about where we're headed I've, i'm also i've never been as terrified as to where we're headed in part because it's, it's still not fast enough but at least people seem to be waking up and that's what's most important is like, at this point, there's no avoiding what's to come, but we can reduce the harm. And so the reduction depends on how quickly all of us like get up off our asses and get in gear. Uh, and so I think it, it's now a question of like, if you're able, do you make the choice to commit? And I think it's time. It's time for folks who are able to come in. I feel like I should go mic drop. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I, you know, I agree with you completely. And it's interesting. Uh, I worked at NASA for many years doing environmental education, earth science, environmental education. And Daniel Hillel, who's a pretty world famous soil scientist, talked about how they were doing these experiments on soil. And one of the things they did is they left a certain plot, a certain number of acres of soil with a hardy ground cover that, you know, damaged soil. They left it with a hardy ground cover and they let it sit with just let it let it do its thing for six months. And he said that there was this incredible time of almost rest for the soil and then there was this huge uptick in in sort of the health of the soil that that things came back if you if you gave the soil the opportunity and i can't help thinking that if we do the same with the earth if we give the earth the opportunity to heal then i think the earth will heal and so the question i have for you is what's the most important thing climate entrepreneurs should be working on that you would fund Oh man, uh, so I'm this one. I'm definitely going to give you a non-answer. <laughs> I like that you preface it that way. Yeah, Great. Yeah. No. I mean, well, I, I recognize. I so, recognize so, it's subjective, Dimitri. I do, but but I would love to know your thoughts on that. So uh, no, I get this question a lot, right? And I get sort of different flavors of this question a lot, which is like, what's most exciting to you? What do you think people should work on? What are you seeing the most traction in? Blah blah. blah. And I think it's 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 a fair question to ask. And how, however, the answer I always give is like, you should work on whatever you think is interesting to you and whatever gets you excited, because frankly, all of the problems are problems and none of them are really solved. And so there, it, there's no point in like chasing the hot thing in climate because they're all hot, right? Like I get equally as excited by low carbon diapers as I do by 
you know, software for financial institutions that helps them think about climate risk as I do by like the next, you know, electric outboard motor for boats. It's all super cool to me. Like every time I see another another company show up, whether they're a small business or a or startup, they like come talk to us and they tell us what they're doing. And my reaction is always the same. I'm like, this is this is awesome. Like, I'm so glad you're doing this. I'm so glad you're stoked that you're doing this. I'm so glad that you have like demand and I want to just give you money so you can lean into that demand. Um, and I, I do think it's, it's important to like, to note that because everything needs to change, you don't really need to like, uh, you, you don't really need to like sit in a job that doesn't make you stoked every day to work in climate because there's so much opportunity. And so if you are passionate about the intersection of climate and water, like go work on that. You know, if you're passionate about uh, uh, environmental justice, go work on that. Um, if you, it, and I, I, that, I think that's sort of like the 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 thing that I'm, I, I want to, I'm very careful about with folks is that I don't want to make them feel like they need to reinvent themselves to work on this problem. It, it's, it's, it's all optional. Like, go, go do it, you know? For sure. For sure. And and I appreciate your answer because I, I agree with you. It is whatever it is you, the individual entrepreneur that's excited about, go work on that. I think that's that's great. What I'm actually after a little bit is in your mind, like for the way I put it is this. We can live about three weeks without food. We can live about three days without water. We can live about three minutes without air. And so to me, like clean air, clean water, food access, those are pretty important. Those are the things, right? So when we're talking about this, I'm talking about the exciting stuff that's going on that people are going to be able to feel immediately, right? When you're funding something, some of this is longer term, right? We're looking at climate versus weather, right? You're looking at what are the long-term projections? And you said yourself, we're not gonna be able to stave off the worst of it, but we can stave off some. So what is the thing as far as your concern, and I'm gonna hold your feet to the fire on this, Dimitri, what is the most important thing to work on? Not that you'll fund even, but that is the most pressing issue. Well, I, again, like I think that, look, we are in this really fascinating moment where we have like a decade to act and that action needs to reduce emissions, that action needs to pull emissions out of the atmosphere, and that action needs to enable adaptation and resilience for like some of the most marginalized communities out there. And all of that work has to happen concurrently because there's just no time. And so I think to some degree, this is a debate that we also have often in sort of the investment side of this universe is like, where should money flow? And my argument is that it should flow into everything. Like, it's not about a question of, of prioritizing limited resources. It's about getting more resources into the problem and funding all of it, because there's no time. We can't be just making bets on the gigaton or five gigaton solution, because, and, and for folks who don't know what that means, is like the solutions that generate a reduction in emissions of at least one or five gigatons. These are often like investment criteria for certain funds. And I think that's a, like a, a kind of a, a weird way to think about this problem when like betting on something that will reduce emissions over the next 50 years by five gigatons is like kind of irrelevant when we only have 10 years left. And so I think that if, if folks want to feel like they're having the most impact, it's it's all relative. Like it, it's up to them to decide what's impactful to them. And as long as it's within this problem set, it really doesn't matter. Like I, I, I genuinely believe that folks working on problems that maybe reduce a few tons of emissions a year, like if they're stoked about it and they put everything into it, it's just as valuable as folks who are working on reducing a gigaton of emissions in 30 years, if they're stoked about it. And they're going to have very different feedback loops on what like what impact they see in real time, and that's okay. I think you know a lot of people are wired differently. Like, uh, you know, I think it's really important to work on policy in climate. It is not something I can do. Like I've tried. It drives me bonkers. <laughs> I, I like I, I just understand. like 
I don't, I don't enjoy it. And I find a lot of the sort of mechanics of it really frustrating. And so I, I don't do it. Um, do I think other people absolutely should? Yeah, a hundred percent. And there are people who are incredible at it, right? Folks who can, who can sort of weave their way through the landscape, you know, on the Hill or in, in, in the state capital or wherever and get what they want done. I'm not that person. Um, you know, I also think that like getting, uh, yeah. So I, you know what I mean? Like for me, it's a question of aligning what makes you excited and where you're going to be able to output the most pro like the most execution. That's what you should be working on because it's just a question of getting everything done fast. Yeah. Cause we don't have that much time for sure. And I appreciate you saying that very much because, this notion of, for example, policy, that would that would make me pull all my hair out, too, if I were the person who had to go do that. So there is a mindset. I mean, this is the Innovative Mindset podcast, so I get to talk about mindset. There is a mindset issue at stake here, right? How do you keep yourself dedicated for years? Those of us who worked in climate and in the environment were being told, over and over again that there was no issue at all. So now most people say, yes, there is an issue. Okay, now we work on it. But it feels to me like we're starting a train and it's going very, very slowly, even though the need for it is great. And even more so in underserved and underrepresented communities, right? Because the, the, the cities you mentioned, urban areas, most of them, uh, have, and states, that have a lot of urban areas uh, are funding. But there are lots of places in, in, in the USA where climate change is going to have just as much, if, more, if not more of an impact, yet they don't have those kinds of programs. What are your thoughts and what guidance would you give to someone who is in an underserved, underrepresented community who still wants to work on this issue? Yeah, this is this is tough because I, I want to be very mindful of the fact that I'm like a very privileged white guy and I'm not um, the, the, I'm not speaking from lived experience in the same way, mm -hmm. but I, I do think that there are options, right? So one is, it, it really depends on your circumstance, okay? So let's say, I'm going to sort of generalize, right? Let's say you're in a position where you cannot work on this problem directly in your day-to-day -day job. Um, well, then you can advocate for others to work on it and you can advocate for your government and your representatives to work on it. Um, you can, you know, if you have kids, you can inspire them to think about working on it if they're able or to also communicate about it, right? Like dialogue, I think it's very important right now because we need everybody on board. And so if you care about this problem, speaking about it with others is, is actually incredibly valuable, right? Especially folks who, who are sort of on the edge. Um, I think that's, that's one. Uh, two, if you are able to sort of think about how your work impacts this problem, then I would start educating yourself about the opportunities to then shift, right? So let's say you have a job that is that you, you don't consider sort of climate, right? Uh, I, mean, I don't know, I'll pick something. Let's say you're a, a car mechanic, right? Well, um, if you have the opportunity to look for alternative places of employment, you might look for places that focus on working on electric vehicles. It's actually good for you in terms of your career, probably because well, electric vehicles will become more and more dominant over time. And if the shop you work in today doesn't, doesn't service them, then they're probably going to start losing business in the long term. Um, I, I, I think that in general, like, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, right, to shift careers, to find new employment. Um, it, it is kind of like an interesting time. It's a very tight labor market, and there's a lot of demand. And so probably if there ever was a moment to, to change employers to get it more aligned with climate. Like now is a pretty good time. Um, I think a lot of folks feel like they need an education in climate to work on climate. And, uh, and that's not the case, right? Like I think, again, really any job can serve this agenda, right? And so you just have to find an employer who's working on this problem where your role is needed. 
I think also like, it's not just, this places a lot of onus on people who, who are in these positions, who are under, you know, who, who come from sort of like, who are in underprivileged or marginalized communities. It, the onus isn't necessarily on them. It's actually on us to create opportunity and to, to create sort of a more equitable distribution of resources so that folks in those communities can participate. And so really the like call to action is to everybody else okay. to create employment opportunity, to create funding opportunities, to create educational opportunities, to like focus their resources on the people who are most impacted by this problem. Because frankly, like the, the, the privileged few of us are the ones who will weather it best because we have the resources to weather it best. We have, you know, air conditioners or, you know, money to, to, to like deal with uh, extreme weather events or what, like whatever it is, um, the, the, the folks who are in those, who are in marginalized communities or who are sort of, uh, who have less privilege are the ones who will be impacted most by climate change. And so, for that reason, you know, at Enduring Planet, we prioritize investing in underrepresented founders, diverse teams, and companies serving marginalized communities. We actually they they get a better rating in our credit policy, and we we have like a it's a focus for us. It's part of our corporate DNA. So we formed our company as a public benefit corporation as part of our corporate mission is to do just that. And and frankly, I think if you're working in climate and you have the opportunity to make those choices because you're you're leading an organization, you're building a program, you're investing in the space. That should be part of your mission too. And if it's not, I think you should reflect on the like problems that you're perpetuating in society that got us into this mess in the first place. And I think often folks will find that they have not been thoughtful about inclusion and equity in their climate work and it, it's actually not a big change. It's not, it's not a huge effort to integrate it into your work if you're thoughtful, if you care. Hmm. I'm thinking, uh, I, some people call it dead air. I call it anticipatory air. I like to listen and take in and then, and then think before I, <laughs> just so that you're not wondering why is she quiet? Uh, well, I think, I think maybe the thing to say here is like, your, your climate action has to be intersectional or it's not true climate action. If your work just serves the privileged few, you're not doing it right. And I, I like hold that very firmly. And I think it's incredibly important. And I think it's something that all of us should be reflecting on all the time. Yeah, it's like that that Native American uh, saying that everything you do, you should think about how it's going to impact and affect seven generations from you. And I think that there that there's something about that that really resonates with a lot of people now because that that they're becoming more mindful. They're becoming more aware of this. But I want to I want to move a little bit into a slightly different direction in that uh, what you said about that we need to be uh, reaching out to people, especially people in, in marginalized or underrepresented communities and, and helping them along if, if that's what they want, if that's what they need. And I think that's great. The thing that I'm wondering though, is how do we get that entrepreneurial spirit alive in people who are, as you said, going to a job day to day and who may not have the time or the resources or the energy to look outside of that and and see possibilities. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I think in some ways we probably um, overemphasize entrepreneurial action or like being an entrepreneur in our society. Uh, I don't think everybody needs to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, and I think most people actually shouldn't. It's 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 hard. Uh, in, in ways that are very unique. Um, it requires a very specific type of like energy and commitment and, and, and sort of interest and passion. Um, and, 
and I'm, I want to be clear here. It's not that like people who don't, who aren't entrepreneurs don't have those things. It's just that theirs are channeled in different ways. Right. And so just like, I don't want to work on policy. There are lots of folks who like shouldn't be entrepreneurs. Um, I think obviously if you do want to be an entrepreneur and you don't have the resources to be one, that's a different problem. And this is where I think investors, the government, private wealth, public wealth, like th there's, there's all of these sources of capital that should create opportunities for folks that are um, underrepresented to start businesses and climate. And there are programs that, that sort of do that. Um, there's, uh, you know, SBIR is like uh, an incredible federal effort to provide very early stage capital to entrepreneurs. And there are also like state grants to do this. Um, but there needs to be more, right? And I think figuring out where that money comes from is, is like the big question, right? Like who should be supporting these very, very early moments? And, and, and like, what should their expectations be around return? If there is any, should these be grants? Should they be loans? Should they be equity? Like, I, I think that's the debate that needs to happen and it needs to happen very fast. And frankly, I think there's often too much focus on like the sleek and the sexy and less focus on the often the people who do the real, like the really hard work of actually getting the products in the hands of, of consumers and getting the services online. Like, I think that folks who want to start a, a heat pump servicing business are just as important to this transition as like the, the people who want to start a, uh, like a high tech startup in climate. Um, and, and frankly, like their success rates, their impact on, on a time scale, et cetera, like are very different. And we should value both because again, like the whole system needs to change. And so, you know, is that a problem that Enduring Planet would solve? I don't know. Uh, I, I would love to think that one day we will have a product that works in those contexts. It's in the end, like we're, we're a capitalist organization, right? Like we make a profit, we raise money, we deploy money. And so we are, we are within the confines of what we wanna do. We are still pursuing opportunities that have the largest market and the, the greatest returns for us while also meeting these criteria of being founder friendly and climate, et cetera, right? And so, um, but a lot of other actors don't have those same priorities and restrictions and they need to be thinking critically about where they have the most impact. And I think our experience, for example, when, when I was at at Meta and we built the energy access program, we approach the question of the impact that we wanna have, not from the, oh, we have this tool, where can we deploy it? It was actually working backwards from the, the problem itself. And we said, okay, money is not flowing into the space and money is the greatest driver of progress in this market because the tech is already there, the talent is already there and the capital is just not flowing. And so, what is it about the financing ecosystem where there are blockers? And the more time we spent, the more we realized that like perception of risk and real risk weren't particularly aligned. And so that meant that if you wanted to be catalytic, the thing, one of the most catalytic things you could do was basically to buy risk and to show people that real risk was different. And sometimes we were right and sometimes we were wrong. But in the end, our capital was incredibly sort of like it facilitated a, a very large amount of financing because we took bets based on this idea that like money can serve a purpose to unlock other money. And I think that, you know, when it comes to uh, government funding or, or, or private foundation or corporate foundation or, you know, public, public charity funding, like folks need to start thinking more about the underlying issues that prevent action rather than like, oh, we need to give grants to put solar panels on, you know, public schools. Like, okay, maybe that's the problem, but like, maybe not. Maybe if you actually supported, you know, something four steps prior, that outcome would happen anyway, and you would get more leverage on your dollars. 
And so I, I encourage folks to like, think about where can they can get the most leverage? Where can they get the most sort of like knock on effect for their dollars? Because if you're not doing that calculus, you're likely not having the most impact that you can with your funding. I think you need to come up with a tool for that, Dimitri. <laughs> that sounds like an incredibly useful tool, although probably lots of parameters. But but there is this notion of 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 that kind of an assessment that allows you to look at this all. I think I don't know if this is the right word, but it's almost like holistically. You're looking at it from from multiple sides to see what what the greatest impact could be. And when you're doing that, how I guess, what are the weights that you're giving to climate, the climate crisis itself to the people? Is there a set of ratios there or is it just we're going to work on it holistically and go from every possible angle to try and make this impact? I think it just depends. It really depends on who you are and what you're doing. Um, we we approach the, the space very like openly. Mm -hmm. um, for us, nothing is out of scope as long as it meets our investment criteria. Um, I think everybody needs to make those choices for themselves, right? Like some folks have specialty to work on very technical questions and like they should apply their energy and resources to that. And some folks have their specialty working on other things and they should apply their energy and resources to that. Um, we just all have to do our part, you know? Uh, do I, did I understand that question correctly? Yeah, no, you did. You did. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So then uh, this is a, this is a bit of a woo woo question, but what would success look like to you for enduring planet, but also with, with climate, the climate crisis itself? I mean, I, I, I think for us success, you can sort of measure it in a couple of different ways, but I think at the, at the highest level, it's that when an entrepreneur in the climate space needs growth capital and they want to raise something other than equity they come to us first that's success for me um i want to serve everybody in this market uh and i want to do it quickly and i want to do it fairly and equitably um and if we can do that uh, then that's a pretty incredible outcome um you know we have targets for how much money we want to put to work in this space and they're pretty aggressive and pretty large um, but I think in the end, like the question is not how much money do we put to work, but how do people feel about it and do they get mm -hmm. value out of it? And do they mm -hmm. feel like it's, it's deployed in a way that serves them? Because I think often, um, entrepreneurs don't feel like their incentives are aligned with their investors. Mm. And, and that's something that we really want to be mindful of. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, we're not doing it perfectly now. Like this is this is going to be an iterative process where we learn and we get feedback and we have people who don't take our money and people who tell, turn us down and people who think our process is bad or people who think our our capital is expensive or like whatever. We're we're going to get all of that and that's okay um, because it's all part of learning how to make a, an instrument that really serves the interest of the community that we're focused on. Um, so I, it's pretty, it's been a really wild year and I guess three months now, and, um, there's many more to come. And so we're just getting started. This is, this is a very early moment. Um, and I'm really excited about what we're building and the team that we have and the impact that we've already had. And, um, yeah, wild time to be alive. Absolutely. I, I love it, Dimitri. I'm so grateful that you took the time to be here and to chat with me about this. You mentioned your website just a minute ago. I would love it if you would, people learn differently. So some people like to see it and it'll be in the show notes. But if you could say what the what the various social channels and the website uh, are so that so that anybody who's interested in finding out more about Enduring Planet could find you, that would be great. Yeah. So uh, we we are we take pride in how transparent we are. And so our, our website has actually a lot of material on sort of how we work, who we work with, um, what our terms look like. And that's just enduringplanet.com. Uh, we're pretty active on Twitter. And so you can, you can find us on Twitter. It's enduring underscore planet, or, you know, I think if you just search for enduring planet, you'll find it on Twitter. Um, same on LinkedIn. 
Uh, we're pretty active there as well. Those are sort of our main avenues. We haven't yet gotten to sort of TikTok. I don't know, maybe one day. <laughs> we'll be we'll be cool enough to get on TikTok. Um, but but those are our sort of our primary our primary channels. And then yeah, we we like to do we like to have a lot of these conversations. I think uh, podcasts are sort of where a lot of folks go to learn and listen. And uh, we 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 try to do a good number of these so that we can reach the most people and and give them a sense of sort of what we're about and what we're trying to build. And look, I think maybe the last thing I'll say is uh, even if we're not the right fit for you, um, we want to help you. If you're a founder, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business in this space, we want to help you get the capital you need to grow. And so uh, we we actually have a lot of partnerships to help folks raise money outside of our own funding. Um, because in the end, like if you have money to save the planet, that's all I need. And um, so reach out. We're happy to help. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome, Dimitri. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I have just one last question before we end the uh, formal part of the podcast chat and go to the informal bonus round. And the question is this. If you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Oh, whoa. Um, that's a great question. I ask it of every single person who comes on the show. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I think in the in the spirit of this conversation, maybe it'd be like go work on climate, <laughs> or or um, or the world's on fire, mm. uh, fight climate change. Yeah. I think maybe like something like that. Um, something that just encourages people to like take stock of the situation we're in and and maybe change where they commit their time. That works for me. That works for me great. Dimitri, thank you so much for being on the show. We're going to come right back and do the bonus episode. In the meantime, this is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, reminding you, as always, go read the show notes, go find out about Enduring Planet. Get in touch with me if you have questions about the podcast or some of the other things that I've been doing. And until next time, be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. <music> Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2023. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living what you believe in.